So in the criminal justice system, sexually based offenses are considered especially heinous. In New York City, the dedicated detectives who investigate these vicious felonies are members of an elite squad known as the Special Victims Unit. These are their stories. Bum, bum. You guys know that, right? If you turn on the USA channel, I feel like at any time of the day, you're going to see Law & Order Special Victims Unit on there. And it's a good show, right? Uh, if, if you've ever been around, uh, in, in, if you live in America, you have seen at least some exposure to Law & Order, particularly SVU is better than the original Law & Order in my opinion. But, uh, but the SVU, they have that introduction and we're used to hearing that because we, we've heard it so many times. And they say that sexually based crimes are especially heinous. And, and that's kind of the point that Paul's going to get at in 1 Corinthians 6. He's going to explain sexually based sin. Um, sexual immorality is a major focal point in the book of 1 Corinthians. And what we're going to see is that he explains why it is especially heinous or especially offensive to our God. And so we have to strive to abstain from sinning against our bodies sexually. It's very difficult for us, but that effort is worth it. And so the sermon title today is Worth It, and I have four points for you if you want to write them down. Um, these four points we're going to look at is we're going to look at the, the principle of control, Self-control versus um, control of, of uh, being controlled by sin as well as being controlled by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at control. Secondly, we'll look at purpose, um, the purpose of sex, the purpose of other things in our lives. Third, we'll look at perversion, how we take God's intended purposes and flip them and pervert them into things that, that please and suit ourselves. And then fourthly and finally, we will look at ownership. I think the issue of worship is mainly concerned with are we um, rightfully acknowledging who God is in our lives and that he has ownership of us. And so uh, point number one is control. You know, self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. We read in Galatians chapter 5, there are nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. And it's not like spiritual gifts, like I have this fruit of the Spirit, but I don't have this fruit of the Spirit. No, fruit is singular in that passage. And it says, if you, so what that tells us is if you are a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit, then you will show these nine attributes of the Holy Spirit. And one of them is self-control. And so that, that's one of the issues I have with some of these real crazy churches that, you know, they're like, they're like shaking and falling on the floor and all that stuff, is, is they, they'll tell you that the, the Spirit is taking over them. But, but the difficulty with that doctrine is that the Spirit doesn't take away control completely. Like we have self-control. That's actually what the Spirit brings to us. We're able to control ourselves because of the Holy Spirit. And so control is good. Control of self is very good. It's good for us to be under control of ourselves. But control of other people is frowned upon in our society. I'll prove it to you. You ever, you ever drive someone somewhere and they hop in shotgun and they, they mess with your radio or they start turning dials on your thermostat? Is, is anybody else like me? Like I get, like there is no greater offense in my life than for you to get in my truck and start turning all the dials and stuff. And Ryan Navy, if you're watching, Ryan is the worst. Pastor Ryan will get in my truck. He'll change the music. He'll take the aux cord. He'll take my charger. He'll turn the AC, whatever he wants. And, and it makes me so mad when people try to take control over me, right? And, and most of us are wired that way, that we get angry. We get defensive when, when other people try to control our actions and control what we do. And so my question is, if we don't like other people to control us, why do we so easily let sin control us? Why do we so easily allow our vices and, and bad habits creep into our lives and slowly take control of us? And it doesn't take much for you to look into your life and you'll see that there are sins either currently or in your past that have really taken control over you. And so the Corinthians were in this position. They had spun out of control within their lifestyles and they were being controlled by their sin more than they were being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 12. Paul writes this, he says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. When he repeats this saying, all things are lawful for me, he says it twice in this verse. What that probably means is he's quoting something that has been said often. What it most likely means is that the Corinthian Christians, this was kind of a, a motto, maybe on their church signs when they were leaving 
Uh, they're gathering every Sunday. Maybe that was what they put on their church sign. See you next week. All, remember, all things are lawful for me. We can do whatever we want, right? And so, um, so Paul is quoting something that had been said often by the Corinthians. And he says, hey, all things are lawful for me. That may be true. We are set free from the Old Testament law. It's a good principle, but we are not free to be lawless. We are not to live in lawlessness. He says, so all things are lawful for me, but not everything's good for me. Not everything's helpful. He says, I will not be dominated by anything. Dominated in the Greek is exousia. And I think it's interesting that the same word exousia is used by Jesus when he gives the great commission in Matthew 28. He's, he comes to the disciples and he says, all authority, exousia, has been given to me. And I always like to say, it doesn't matter what comes after that. If he says, do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around, you've got to do it because all exousia, all authority has been given to Jesus. He has all the authority. And so what Paul is saying when he says, uh, I will not be dominated by anything, nothing will have exousia, authority over me, is he's saying, nothing will take the authority in my life that Jesus is supposed to have. How many times do we allow sin and things that we think are pleasing and helpful for us to creep in and steal the authority that Jesus is supposed to have in our lives and we give it away to people or uh, things or vices? It, it, like, if, are you, ask yourself, are you giving Jesus his rightful authority? When he says to the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me, that stands true for you today, church. You are to rightfully acknowledge that he has authority over your life. He's not begging you to do stuff for his kingdom. He has authority over you in his kingdom. Exousia. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And so there's a principle that when we give authority to Jesus, we no longer live in our flesh to please our flesh. We live in the spirit if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. You see, we're to yield control to the Spirit instead of our sin or our flesh. And if, if we are said to be out of control at all, let us say that we're out of control but yet under the control of God. It's difficult, though, to remain within the Spirit's control, isn't it? But it's worth it. It takes effort on our part to stay within the Holy Spirit's parameters, but it's worth it. So let's look at point number two, which is purpose. You see, the key to not letting external things control us is knowing what their proper purpose is. And if we get things outside of the realms of purpose within uh, what God has gifted to us, then we will begin to let those things control us, which is not God's intention. For example, money is not sinful in its, in its proper purpose. Money is a gift from God. It's a blessing from God. We're to use it to build up God's kingdom. That's why we steward it back into ministry efforts. Money is not sinful, but it has potential to be very sinful. It has a lot of potential to have exousia over you in your life and control you and have authority over you. Similarly, sex is not sinful in its proper purpose. We need not demonize sex like, it's, like in all cases sex is some bad thing. In its proper purpose, it is a very good thing gifted to us by a father who loves us. Food or drink is not sinful in its proper purpose. It is gifted to us by God. Have you thought of the gift of food? I mean, good Lord, we have a gravy fountain here this morning. Look at, look at how, look at in God's creation, how he could have made us pull up at a gas station and put a nozzle in the side of us to fuel up. But he said, no, the way my creation is going to fuel up is they're going to enjoy this fuel. There's going to be an infinite number of tastes built into how they fuel their bodies. You see, and it's proper purpose. It's good. But the Corinthians were likely arguing this that they belong to a spiritual religion. And since Jesus was primarily concerned with their souls, that he was not at all concerned with their bodies. And that's simply not true. The argument may have been, Jesus is concerned with my soul, so I can do whatever I want with my body. And so hence they had sexual immorality, they had drunkenness, they had gluttony, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now Paul compares food and sex in the next couple of verses to show that the physical body is indeed important to God's glory. We don't neglect our bodies for the sake of our souls. Verse 13, he says, Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. You see, the reasoning of the Corinthians was that since the stomach was designed to digest food, 
That they, so, so anytime that they were hungry, they should eat. It makes sense, right? So then they follow that logic and they say, well, my body is made to, to have sexual relations. And so anytime that my body tends to lead me to want sex, I should just go have sex. Well, it doesn't quite work like that because God had put certain parameters on that. And so Paul is drawing the line here. Food has its purpose. It's to be pleasurable and it's to keep us alive. Sex, similar, has its purpose as well. It's to be pleasurable, for sure, and it's to procreate, but it is to be carried out within biblical marriage. There's a clear teaching on that. Paul goes into further detail in the next chapter, in chapter 7. Jimmy and Patrick are going to preach that to you next week as they work through the teaching of what marriage looks like and what sex is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to be within marriage alone. And so, but, the, but the purpose of this passage is that our bodies are to be used for the glory of God. And so our bodies will one day be redeemed and resurrected and perfected just like Jesus is. Isn't that good news? I, like I was so tempted to cancel all services today because my whole body is in pain today because I played in this all-star coaches game last night. There was no all-star to it. It was just all coaches. But to me, it was like an all-star game. And they lowered the rims to nine foot four. And I got three dunks in the game last night. And man, I was proud when I was going home. Man, it was like, you feel good about yourself, don't you? I was like, yeah. I was high-fiving kids, signing autographs. They didn't ask me to sign. I was just like all about it, you know. And, and then I woke up this morning. I'm like, babe, I can't walk. I cannot get up this morning, right? Jimmy and Patrick texted me at 6.45 saying, hey, we'll meet you at Tudor's. Maybe, you know, like, whew, too many dunks last night. But I did dunk it. Some of y'all are arguing with me. So um, it did happen. I'm still trying to find the footage, but I promise it happened. I wouldn't lie, at least not from the pulpit, okay? <laughs> but it's good news, isn't it, that our bodies are going to be perfected one day. We won't ever have a pain anymore. We won't be sore anymore. We won't, we won't have any sort of ailments come upon us anymore. Let me just preview this from 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Jesus rose with a physical body. He's not just a goat floating or a ghost floating around in heaven. He went to Thomas, and what did he tell Thomas? He said, you don't believe me? Hey, feel my side. Put your hands here. You can, you can feel me. You can touch me. He had a physical body, and so we will have a body. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but it's going to be better than this one. I can tell you after playing a basketball game, it's going to be a heck of a lot better. And we're going to be like Jesus. And so we will be raised. And for this reason, we're called to honor the Lord with our bodies and use them for their intended purposes. But disobedience has ramifications on our bodies. Sexual immorality carries a host of problems along with it. Promiscuity carries a risk of sexually transmitted diseases. Multiple sexual partners carries a load of emotional baggage. And if you don't believe me, Please trust your Lord on this and the scriptures on this before you go through the baggage of having many sexual partners. Pornography will corrupt your mind and will produce unrealistic expectations in your current marriage or in your future marriage. Studies have shown that our brain's addiction to sex can rival addictions to opioids and other drugs, that we can become just as much, if not more, addicted to sexual activity. And when we fill ourselves with either a physical sexual act or looking on a screen to produce that in us, then it produces unrealistic expectations of what God has intended in our marriage. And we have got to use God's gift in its intended purpose. I'll put it this way. If I, if I, don't, have, if I don't have any gas in my truck and I'm broke and I need some money and I'm just praying that somebody in the church notices my tank on E, and they want to bless the pastor, and I'm hoping for a BP gift card. But somebody comes up and they say, hey, I got you a Snickers, homeboy. It would be foolish for me to say, thank you, unwrap that Snickers, and bloop, drop it in my gas tank. Right? It's not going to accomplish anything. And what it actually does is it wastes the, perp the person's money who bought the candy bar for me. And so when we take a gift from God and try to use it in a way that God never intended for it to be used, we waste what God has given us. And God has given us not just sex, but many gifts in life. And when we take them and we use them for something else, there's a clear word for that. It's called perversion. 
perversion is point three. It, it means an altering of something from its intended purpose. We say, thank you, God, for this gift, but I'm not going to use it how it's intended to be used. I'm going to use it how I want to use it. And it's not a coincidence that the word pervert is often used to describe sexual deviance. It's a, it's a hat tip to the point that we take God's gift of sex and pervert it, and we indulge in porneia, this Greek word that's translated sexual immorality to cover all these extramarital sexual activities that we love to indulge in. He continues in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Paul's quoting from Genesis chapter 2. Let me read that to you. He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. It's this beautiful picture physically in sexual intimacy as well as um, emotionally and spiritually. And verse 25 says, and the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, were both naked and were not ashamed. You ever thought about this verse? This is a cool verse. They were naked and they were not ashamed. They, they probably left the bathroom door open. Like they, there was no shame there, right? And I know y'all women are like, when are you going to put the seat back down for us? My question to you ladies, when have you put the seat up for us, right? And, come on now. Come on, somebody. Right? <laughs> but there was no shame within their marriage. They didn't have to worry about, uh, about how their bodies were perceived with one. Wouldn't that be great to be in that pre-fall mindset? without sin and, and, and the self-consciousness and low self-esteem that comes along with it. God's desire in your marriage is to get as close to that as possible. There should be very little shame as we enter into marriage, but oftentimes we're coming into marriage carrying baggage of former partners and, and pornography and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and dealing with lust in our own minds, and what that produces is so much shame and difficulty in our marriages. You see, the joining of man and woman, spiritually and emotionally, was mirrored and illustrated by their physical union sexually. And so when Paul addresses the Corinthians and their sexual immorality, he says that they're making a mockery of God's blessed union in marriage. Because what they were doing is they were mimicking the physical union of marriage without the emotional attachment and without the spiritual attachment and without the commitment of provision and respect and honor and love. They had cheapened God's gift by perverting it into, we're only going to take the things that are easy for us. Verse 17, he continues, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. You see, our bodies ultimately do not belong to us, but they belong to the Lord. And so instead of being sexually promiscuous, whether that's physically or that's just in our minds or it's on a phone or a computer, we ought to make sure that we are one with the Lord and asking for the Holy Spirit's help to remain pure. You know, now listen to me. Scripture often tells us to fight and stand firm against sin, but in the face of sexual temptation, we're not told that. We're told to flee. We're not told to fight against it. In this case, this case of especially heinous sin against God, we're told to run Run from it. Sexual sin is something that we are to turn and run from. We see a story of Joseph in Genesis and Potiphar's wife coming after him to tempt him sexually. And he runs from it so much so that she holds his coat in her hand as she's trying to get after him. He runs from sexual temptation. And it's difficult to resist the temptation to pervert the world around us to resist the temptation to objectify bodies and to sexualize everything. It is difficult to resist that temptation, but it's worth it. And point four is ownership. And here's why it's worth it. Verse 19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? This is a good principle for us. Your body is a temple. Now, the context of what Paul is addressing here is they would go to a literal temple and in, in the secular pagan way of worship, they would provide uh, prostitutes at the temple. And so as you went to worship these many gods, um, they were polytheistic generally in, in that city, in that culture. And they would have these pros temple prostitutes that as an act of worship, 
to these false gods, they would go and they would ga- engage in sex with these, with these prostitutes. And so in its context, I want you to know that when it says your body is a temple, it's talking mainly about having sex with hookers, okay? That's basically what Paul's addressing. But there's a principle here that we should take care of our bodies. We should not be careless or reckless with our bodies. But let's remember that context of sexual immorality. Now, I've, I've heard this verse used to argue against ta- t- tattoos, which you guys know where I stand on that. I got a little bit of ink. Um, I've heard it used to argue against tobacco use. Um, I've heard it used to argue against non-organic food or, or makeup. Or, you know, I've heard it used for a lot of different things. Your body is a temple, so don't disrespect it. And primarily, it's talking about sexually. But generally, take care of it too. But listen, you're not damaging God's temple by piercing your ears. Okay, so hear me clearly on that. But we're to be respectful knowing that God is going to raise our bodies imperishable one day. The principle at hand is ownership. Okay, the principle at hand is that I acknowledge that whatever I do with my body, I do not own my body. It belongs to God. Ultimately, the Christian has yielded everything to the Lord. My, my bank account, my home, my, my vehicles, my wife, my children, my own body, every, everything in my life is owned by God. I've yielded it all to him. That's what it means to commit to be a Christian, that I'm giving everything up to him. So whatever you do with your bodies, it must be within his will. Verse 19b and verse 20 says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Can you just meditate on this for a minute? What a, what a profound statement. Some of you guys really, I'm, I'm not, don't just breeze by this verse. Some of you guys really need to hear this today. You are not your own. That is a deep statement, but this is what it means to follow Christ, is that I am no longer living for myself. I am not my own. I wholeheartedly, body, soul, and spirit, and my mind, and my strength, everything belongs to him because he bought me with a price. Most of your decisions in your fleshly nature filter through your own desires first, or your own needs first, but listen, You are not your own changes everything, doesn't it? It's a motto for our lives that we can filter decisions through now that we have Jesus. We can remember that when we're doing things, hey, I am not my own. I don't have the job that I have for my own provision. I have it as gospel leverage. I don't have these possessions for my own comforts. I have them as gospel leverage. I am not my own. I am a soldier in God's army to lead people into this family. He owns me. What a powerful motto for our lives. I was bought with a price. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 13. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He tells this story of a man who, who's digging up a field. It's apparently not his field. We're not sure why he's digging in it. We, the, the, you know, Jesus saw fit to not tell us the reasoning there. But for some reason he's digging in somebody's field that's not his own. He finds a treasure there. And so he says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to buy that field. I'm going to sell everything that I have so that I can have the greatest treasure that's buried in that field. This is a picture of what Jesus did for us. He laid down everything. He laid down, he did not account his equality with God, something to be held onto very tightly. He laid it down and he came to the nastiness of this fallen world so that he could live the perfect life we never could and so that he could do everything in his power, going to the cross, being murdered, raising from the dead to purchase a treasure, his sons and daughters. You know why it's worth it to remain pure? Because Jesus saw you as worth it. Jesus says you're worth his incarnation, his coming from heaven to this earth. He says you're worth his perfect life that he lived. He says you're worth his agony, pain, and death on the cross. He says his resurrection provides your worth so that you are no longer worthless. You have immense value because of who you were purchased by. You are not your own, you are bought with a price, and that price is a high cost, the blood of our Savior. Jesus, thankfully, paid it all on the cross for us. All the debt is paid, and so next time you're asking yourself, and you're faced with sexual temptation, or any temptation for that matter, and you're asking yourself, is it worth it? 
Maybe I won't get caught. Maybe I can get away with it. Is it worth it? Ask yourself, were you worth it to Christ? For him to die in your place, to drink the wrath of the Father for your benefit? Was it, were you worth it? And the answer is, of course, yes. And if that's the answer, then it is worth it for you to remain pure. It's worth it for you to take measures for purity in your life. It's worth it for you to remain holy. It's worth it for you to put effort into ministry. It's worth it for you to give sacrificially. It's worth it for you to do things that are radical in the eyes of the world. It is worth it for you to live as a follower of Jesus.